Felix? Oh, there we go. Okay. Thank you guys uh, for the last minute for coming here. Obviously, the shows are going on at, um, you know, in the Katie Murphy today, so they kicked us out. So thank you for coming here at the last minute. A um, couple of things. You probably all noticed the app changed. Some of you got in. Some of you did not. So if you didn't get in, make sure you see me after class. I'll make sure you're signed in. If you're having problems, make sure that you're going to FIT Joshua um, Williams. That's the, the link. Uh, it should allow you in um, with your past credentials, but if it doesn't, let me know. Some of you already have, and I'll be calling them to see what, what's going on. Um, in terms of uh, homework, I have, I'm going to be grading sort of all of the event critiques coming up in the next week, just so you guys are, are uh, prepared for that. Um, and also just a reminder that we only have a few weeks left, so if you do need to get your Q, uh, Q and A's in or uh, you want to start planning for that. Um, also. I'll be posting the last speaker for uh, the May 7th, um, and also just wanted to let you know that the Fashion Service Network has confirmed for the panel discussion, so we're looking forward to a really great panel for that last day of class. So, um, really excited to have our speaker. We, we had a chance to talk a few months ago, and I thought he would be a really great addition to our series this year. Uh, Jean-Paul Zagami is a designer extraordinaire. You've done everything, as you'll find out. Uh, most recently with Ralph Lauren, uh, working in the watch division and really building that whole entire uh, collection. Uh, and if you know anything about Ralph Lauren watches, uh, they, they run the gamut in price all the way up to $100,000 and more. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll talk about that today. Um, he's now freelances and also is a professor, a teacher at uh, Montclair, Montclair State University. Uh, and, and being able to uh, teach other design students uh, his trade. And he works with a lot of different clients, including um, in the uh, watch area, as well as other areas, including perfume. So uh, without further ado, thank you so much for coming today, uh, John Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Now, <clears throat> I will say real quick, we um, couldn't get the iPad connected correctly. So uh, we are publishing his pictures on a website. So once that publishes, we're kind of watching that today because he has some beautiful pictures of the work he's done. Um, but thanks for coming. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. So you have had uh, quite the career and a lot of it at, at Ralph Lauren, but why don't we start kind of at the beginning a little bit. What got you into design in the first place and um, you know, where did you uh, go to school and how did you prepare well, to become I a designer? Was, I was always drawing from the time I was a child. Uh, I would get in trouble in school because I wasn't paying attention. I was just drawing all the time. So um, um, I, I sort of had a propensity for, for, for drawing and I loved doing it. Um, and that sort of continued uh, through junior high and, and, and high school. Um, while in high school I was, I was a, um, art major and a science major. I was a double major. And um, I had gotten accepted to NYU. I was going to go for pre-med. But I had a portfolio because there was um, a contest that, because uh, I was also in major art at the high school. And um, uh, this uh, company called Scholastics, mm -hmm. they would judge these portfolios and you would win something or win some money. Um, it just so happened that in one week, after, after I was accepted to NYU for pre-med, I thought that's what I was going to be doing, um, someone from Pratt Institute came to our school to interview several students. And by somehow, he got a hold of my portfolio. And um, I got called down to the principal's office, which was the first time that ever happened. I never got called down. And, uh, and I met the, the uh, head of admissions from Pratt. And he said, if you apply to the school, we'll give you some money. Mm -hmm. So um, I had to decide. It sounded more exciting to, to go to Pratt than it did to go uh, into pre-med. I sort of knew what that track would do, you know, what that would be like. So um, my father said, you know, do whatever you want to do, you know. So I, I wound up going to Pratt for four years. Um, and the last, uh, the first year is a foundation year where um, you, know, you take the drawing classes, the light and color classes, 3D design, you, you, know, you took everything in foundation. Um, I didn't decide to go into industrial design until my, uh, the end of my uh, sophomore year. Mm -hmm. um, and then I 
I majored in industrial design. I graduated from Pratt with a uh, degree in industrial design. Uh, didn't know what I wanted to do. I wasn't sure that I wanted to do industrial design. Um, and I wound up uh, getting a job in the TV industry, working with a production company uh, doing uh, test commercials, what they call test commercials, where they would actually film, uh, they'd have an artist, you know, a commercial artist, uh, do magic markers scenes of, you know, of the scenes of each commercial. And they would shoot that on a camera. They'd do zooms, pans, and everything. And um, that was kind of fun, you know. Uh, and I found that I was able to use a lot of my design, uh, uh, my sense of design in doing that. Mm -hmm. So I did that for, for uh, two or three years. Um, and I moved from one production company to another. The, the other production company that I went to uh, uh, was a live action and animation house. And um, so I got to work on animation, um, working on all aspects of animation, uh, doing cell animation, painting backgrounds, watercolor backgrounds. It was great, it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, we were doing stuff for Sesame Street. So I was there for about uh, three, three and a half years, four years. Um, at one point, the computer graphic industry started to really come into its own. There were companies that were making these systems that could do um, packaging design. Um, they could do animation, small snippets of animation at one time. So the production company I was working at uh, bought one of these computer graphic systems. And I've always loved computers. Mm -hmm. um, what, during my, uh, the, when, when I was off during the summers, while going to Pratt, I worked at American Express in the data processing center. I got the job through a friend of mine and I was working on these huge IBM computers, IBM 360s, 370s, which your cell phone has more power. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I really enjoyed uh, doing that. So when uh, computer graphics started coming around, I sort of really took to that. Um, and I, I was like a sponge, I just absorbed it. Uh, and uh, so the company actually sent me for training on the computer since the head of the company didn't understand how to do anything on a computer. So I was doing all the animation on computer. Right. Um, did that for a while. Um, the company that made the computer said, you know, we know other people who have this computer that you could freelance with. Um, and I got a call from Avon Products and they asked me to come and uh, uh, try and use a computer for packaging design. Interesting. Yeah, it wasn't really supposed to be for packaging design, but the way the, the, way the uh, menu structure was, you could easy, easily use it for packaging design. You just wouldn't use the animation functions. Right. So I started freelancing there at, um, we, how are we doing here? Still publishing? Almost, yep. <laughs> oh, God. All right, so, uh, uh, yeah, so I started doing packaging design at Avon Products. Um, which was getting me back into industrial design because I started working on other products that they had. And I was working there three or four days a week, but it turned into a full-time thing. Um, so Avon Products hired me mm -hmm. as their computer gu guru. And um, I sort of built a computer lab. So I had this one computer, then I bought um, a 3D computer, uh, a polygonal modeling computer uh, on IBM. Uh, I was doing fragrance bottles. And from that, we, got, we went to um, a, a system called Wavefront, which was a really high-end 3D computer system uh, that worked on a platform called Silicon Graphics Platform, Unix-based platform. And uh, I had to go out to California for training on that. That was great, that was a great system. But it was $100,000. I mean, I essentially could do everything on my Mac now that, that I did on that system. Um, so I, I built this computer lab uh, at Avon Products, um, and they went. Avon went through a period where uh, they had some some layoffs, major layoffs, and uh, it just so happened my wife was working. I met my wife at Avon, and uh, we were both working there. We had just had my daughter, mm -hmm. and we were worried that uh, one of us or both of us were going to get laid off. So. We were safe. It turns out we didn't get laid off, but we both agreed that one of us had to leave. So the first place that I uh, interviewed at was Ralph Lauren. Uh, a friend of mine who, who was a freelancer at, at Avon always kept saying to me, you should go, you should go check out Ralph Lauren. Mm -hmm. you'd, 
really like it there. You'd have a great time. So uh, it was the first place I went to interview with. Um, and I, I met with the, um, this woman who was a freelance artist there, gave me the name of the head of uh, Home Collection. So I met with the president of, of Home Collection, um, this woman, Nancy Vignola. Um, at the time, their office was on West 55th Street in a very old building. Um, so I went to meet with her. She looked at my portfolio stuff, and um, she said, great, I want to hire you, just like that. I said, wait a minute, we didn't, you know, we didn't talk about what the job would be like. We didn't talk about money. We didn't so she said, well, tell me how much you want. And so um, I kept saying, what's wrong with this picture? It was just too easy. It was just too easy. But um, the only caveat or the only uh, stipulation they had was that they wanted to wait until they moved into the new building, which is where they're now, 650 Madison Avenue, um, before I started working with them. And I was told that would be like six months. So I said, well, that's fine. You know, I have my job at Avon Products. Just give me a letter of intent. Mm -hmm. And in, you know, in six months, I'll give Avon two weeks notice. And so that was really exciting. Um, so while that was going on, I was upgrading computers at, um, at Avon, and um, they gave me a Mac, which I started doing everything on there, <laughs> and the other computers, except for the 3D design, which you still couldn't do any 3D on, uh, on a Mac, but I was doing the packaging design, I was doing logo design, I was doing, uh, you know, a lot of gift design. Um, and then I got a call from Ralph Lawrence saying, after the six months was up, they said, it's gonna probably be another six months mm -hmm. before we get into the new building. I said, not a problem, just give me another letter of intent, which they did. Um, after the six months were up, I gave my notice at Avon, and I started uh, my job at Ralph Lauren the first day they moved into 650 Madison. And did they provide a whole new computer lab? Was that part of the what deal? They, well, they had, at the time, Home Collection had no computers, no printers. So um, it was about three months before they got me a computer mm -hmm. because of all the paperwork and they had never had anything like that there. And it wasn't just a computer I got because um, I, they also got me a wide format printer because while I was still working at Avon, um, they had asked me uh, maybe three months before, say, listen, we want to design these towels, but we keep showing Ralph the towels you know, in small layouts, you know, 13 by 19. I said, well, they're wide format printers. You could buy a wide format printer and print out a full size towel. So they said, well, could you do one for us? Yeah, sure. So I, um, I had my Mac, I, di I did, a, uh, I did a, a design for a towel. Mm -hmm. And I brought it to a friend of mine who worked at this company, uh, AI Friedman, their art supply company. They sell printers, they sell supplies. And I said, could you print this for me, you know, 36 by 72? She goes, yeah, not a problem. I said, if, if it works out, we're going to wind up buying printers from you. So they printed it to me, and they showed it to Ralph. And Ralph was like, where'd you get this from? You know, so, um, so but still, when I got to Ralph Lauren, they still ha didn't have the budget ready for my computers. So they said, we don't know what you're going to do now. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I did, you know, go through training as an industrial designer, I can draw, you know, I think I have pretty good color sense. So they, so they had me drawing things. So I was working on flatware, I was working on uh, towels, I was working on um, uh, crystal, mm -hmm. but I was drawing them by hand. And um, I was working on a, on a flatware project where I had to do, um, Ralph wanted to do this chain flatware. So um, I did maybe 20 drawings of chain flatware. And uh, I was in the meeting, so they, I was in the meeting with Ralph, and and he loved what I did. Um, and Ralph, you know, Ralph said, "Who did these?" So I said, "Well, so Nancy introduced me to Ralph." Mm -hmm. She said, "Where'd you come from?" I said, "Avon Products," <laughs> you know. But um, but after that, Ralph said he wanted me in all the home collection meetings because he liked my hand and the way I, I, I drew. And, and I say that to bring a point that, uh, the point I wanna make is that um, no matter how good your computer system is, um, you need to be able to draw. You have to have a sense of color, sense of proportion, because if you don't have those tools, the computer's not gonna do it for you. Um, 
later on, when I was when I was head of uh, men's graphics for Ralph Lauren, um, and I was interviewing people to work in the graphics department. Uh, you know, I had like 14, 15 designers working for me. I had this guy come in who was, he was really excited and he was, he seemed so gun ho He said, I want to be a designer here. I could, so I'm looking at his education and he was a, a writer. Mm -hmm. um, so he said, well, I know Photoshop and Illustrator. Let me, let me show you what I've done. So I look at what he did and it's like the guy really couldn't draw and he, his color sense, he really didn't have any color sense that I could. I said, you know, these aren't really what we're, this is not what we're looking for. He said, but I did these in 15 minutes. I said, yeah, they look like you did them in 15. <laughs> I, no, uh, you know, I, I, I said, listen, let me tell you the, the truth. I said, you, you're, you're very enthusiastic and I love that, but go back to art school, you know, study drawing and painting and then go, to, then go uh, get on the computer. How much do you think, because in many ways you had a very strong point of view in terms of how you designed in your design aesthetic. Um, yeah. Do you think that that sort of nuanced uh, design aesthetic was what appealed to Ralph Lauren in, in the sense that he saw your talent and saw that it could connect to the Ralph Lauren brand? Yeah, oh, definitely, definitely. Uh, uh, you know, it, it takes a little while for, uh, you know, I, I think part of being immersed in that world you can't help but absorb the, the aesthetic, you know. Um, but being able to draw, that sort of, you know, for, for Ralph, that was, it's like, wow, he could really draw, you know. So, so when the computer was just icing on the cake, mm -hmm. you know, um, because once I knew the aesthetic and I was able to do the drawings and, and do the color layouts, um, I was able to, to uh, do a lot of design very quickly. Um, and if he didn't like something, I could go, go right back on the computer and change it very quickly. I mean, you, you, in many ways, you were sort of at the forefront of the, the switch to graphic design onto the computer, which was a major it, disruption in the design. It industry. was. Yeah. It was. It was. Um, you know, it was interesting. Uh, while I was at Avon, um, someone at MIT, uh, this woman, uh, her name was Muriel Cooper. And she was the head of the Visual Language Lab at MIT. And she saw some of the design that was coming out of Avon. I don't know how she got hold of it. So she actually came to Avon and for, she spent two or three days with me to see how I was using the computers. Um, and, you know, the, what we really figured out was that I, because I was able to soak up the information like a sponge, um, I knew the menu structures. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have to think about where do I go next. It was like I knew how to play the piano, so I was just making the music, you know. So, um, uh, you know, and, and they were asking, well, is the computer doing the design? Or is, because a lot of people were saying, well, now that computer, we have computers, I could have my secretary or my, you know, do design. And, and I, I attended a couple of computer graphics uh, uh, conventions. Um, I was on a dais once and this guy was saying, he showed this project that his, his assistant did for him, who had no graphic sense at all. Uh, but she did it on the computer, you know, and it was like, <laughs> and I said, you know, I said, and I said, I, again, I use a piano analogy. You could go out and buy the best piano in the world. If you don't know how to make the music, it's not gonna matter. And I think that that's becoming even more, the more technology grows and the more um, sophisticated it gets, it doesn't, it still doesn't take away the design aesthetic and the it art doesn't. and design doesn't. training. As a matter of fact, I was able to pinpoint, there were times when um, I was doing things on computer and, and uh, Ralph or Jerry or, you know, Jerry Lauren or someone would say, let's do this variation or, or this other variation. And you could see how the design peaked to where it got to be really good, and then it started to go downhill, and things started to look really terrible, you know? So you knew, you know, you sort of knew that, uh, you know, after a while it was, it just didn't, uh, it wasn't good. I know you, so you were uh, very much a part of the home division before you went to men's graphics. Right. But do you think that because the computer was able to, um, you were able to find variations that that helped to grow that division? Oh, because definitely. That was a fairly new division at the time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely, you know, we wound up buying two or three um, uh, wide format printers and eventually all of the textile artists, um, I was sort of responsible for getting, having them make the transition from, you know, hand painting 
to doing it on computer. Good, keep going. And what was interesting was there were, there were a few people who refused to even look at the computer. Now, I don't, I don't want to do that. You know, it's... Um, and there was this one guy, this Japanese guy, who was an incredible painter. And he was the last one to get on the computer. And um, there were a few other uh, women who were textile designers who were getting on the computer and doing it. And they were having a little bit of trouble with the menu structure, remembering where everything was. And this guy, his name was Aki, he, he gets on the computer and all of a sudden he just took off. You know, it was sort of second nature to him, and he wound up, wound up, he wound up doing everything on a computer. Interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. What, what transition? How did you make the transition from home to men's graphics? And and I know you and you got involved in textile design. And, I did. Yeah. And a, a lot of the soft design. Right. Of, right. Well, I was while I was in home collection, I got to work on a lot of different things besides home. Mm -hmm. um, I got to work on store development. I got to work on fragrance which was really not part of, of home. Um, packaging design. Um, uh, I got to do graphics for some of the t-shirts. Um, we'd have a summer picnic every year and, and all the departments would, would compete for the best t-shirt. And I won that three times. <laughs> you know, Ralph liked what I did. But um, what was interesting was, was that, uh, I'm sorry, your question was again, how did you make the transition the trans from home into uh, yeah. Well, that's kind of interesting. I, I was at home collection for seven years, and um, I thought I was getting stale. I, I sort of sensed I was getting bored with doing things. Um, so I was going to leave Ralph Lauren. But um, I, I figured, let me look and see if there are any other jobs within the company, and, and I couldn't find any. You know, I sort of, you know, put out my feelers, I asked around, and there was nothing there. So, um, you know, I went to say goodbye to Ralph, and Ralph said, no, you're not, le you can't leave. I said, but Ralph, there aren't any jobs for me here, you know. Uh, so I said, well, so they made a job for me in home collection, and that wound up be in, in uh, men's design, and that wound up being the, uh, the men's print department. So we started doing all the men's prints on computer, um, and we started to experiment with doing digital printing, which at the time was very archaic and very, um, it was very expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, you looked at some of the Mamaki printers that were out there or some of the other fabric printers and you had to, um, you know, once you print it, you had to steam it to get the colors right. So it took a long time, you know, before you were able to do that, you know, really do that and, uh, and save money. But, but uh, I always tried to push the technology. Um, while I was in uh, accessory design, this was later on when I was in, um, we were working on, uh, they were working on, on design for, for women's collection. And um, they had this suede that they wanted to send to Italy to print this floral on, but they didn't have enough time. Mm -hmm. So someone came to me with the suede. They said, could you print on this? And I'm looking at it, was, it was kit suede. It was very thin. It was suede and they have voile, and voile is very thin cotton. I said, you know, let's try and put it, put it all over uh, contact paper, and then we'll put the contact paper in the printer. So we actually printed on the suede, and we printed on the voile, and we printed enough yardage for them to make uh, a vest, and they made a dress out of the voile. Beautiful floral. The only, the only thing was you couldn't get it wet because it wasn't color safe. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, but we did it in like two days. So you were actually printing the fabrics in-house. Yeah, we weren't <laughs> supposed to use the printer for that, but right. I said, let's try it. You know? Interesting. I, you know, I've, I'm struck by your story, uh, and we haven't gotten through all of it, but there's a lot of um, sort of what we would refer to as entrepreneurship, the, the idea that you're sort of creating your own jobs yes. within yes. Yes. a much larger company. I'm, in a way... You are an entrepreneur. You just were doing it within Ralph Lauren. <laughs> yes. Because yes. So, you just mentioned you went from men's to accessories. Yeah, that was the last thing I did. Yeah. Okay. Well, what happened after, after I was in men's prints for, for several years, and, um, you know, we did certain things within that department that people hadn't done before where we needed to print yardage for the fashion show, and we, we you know, we, we sent the, uh, the, the files via uh, a Dropbox mm -hmm. uh, or an FTP site uh, to Italy. 
and they printed the yardage right from the, from the graphics that we did. So that hadn't been done before, and they did it very quickly. So we were able to really speed up the design process. Um, that, and that process, I think it bears uh, repeating that we're, we're not talking that long ago that these processes uh, became automated. Right, yeah. that's very true. Yeah, that's so I true. mean, the, the fashion industry has been somewhat slow to adopt some of the, the, the yeah, it w Yeah, a little bit, um, it, it gets, uh, you lose patience sometimes <laughs> when you try and push and, and uh, for the use of technology. But, um, so then I, from, after I went from prints, I went um, to manage the, the graphic design department. And the, pr the whole premise behind that was they were having problems getting all the artwork through these 14 designers. And there was a lack of communication between the design, you know, the, the, the directors, design directors, and the graphics people. Because the, the directors didn't know how the computers worked, so they didn't know what could be done quickly and what could be done, uh, you know, what needed more time. So, uh, you know, a lot of times they'd, they'd come to a, a designer at five o'clock on a Friday and say, I need this for Monday. And uh, so we had a, lot, a large turnover of people in the graphics design department. So I had a meeting with them and said, listen, we have to really pick and choose what we want done. And it was difficult to do because it wasn't just dealing with the design directors. It was, you know, what Ralph wanted, mm -hmm. you know. So, uh, but we were able to get a, a, an easier uh, throughput, uh, uh, you know, of the work. Um, so, so that was a little bit of, bit of a challenge. The other thing I wanted to do while I was there is we had um, uh, spec sheets, what we call spec sheets, which were used for merchandising, where we'd, once the graphic artists would do the sketches of the, the polo shirts or the swimsuits, they'd put it on an InDesign file, which had all the product information. And if they made a change, they had to go back to the, to the designer to redo the InDesign file, which, which was very tedious. So instead of the, having the designer edit the file, I said, why don't we have a website where uh, the merchandising people could just go into a folder and just pick and pull the stuff and drop it onto the, onto the, um, you know, onto the, uh, the file, the InDesign file. Um, so they started looking into that, but, uh, but by that time, I was, um, I had heard about the watch thing going on at Ralph Lauren. Um, and this was something that Ralph really wanted to add to the company. Ralph was always a watch, a watch guy. Ralph and Jerry Lauren uh, and a few other people within the, the company were, were really hardcore watch people. Uh, Ralph always collected watches. Jerry did. I did. Um, I mean, when I was in home collection, Ralph would say, what watch do you have on? You know, and I'd tell him about the watch or, you know. So uh, I had heard through the grapevine that uh, Ralph was talking with... Uh, this guy, Franco Coloni, who at the time was head of Richemont mm -hmm. uh, in Switzerland. Um, and they were trying to get together and somehow make a partnership, but they couldn't do it uh, because Ralph wanted complete control and Franco Coloni didn't want Ralph to have complete control. Uh, Johan, um, rather, uh, Franco Coloni left his position and um, Johan Rupert came to take over as head of, of Richemont. And Johan and Ralph loved each other. They were both car collectors. They were both billionaires who would, you know, compare stories. I mean, the only difference was Johan was very boisterous and very loud, and Ralph was very quiet and demure. But um, so they bonded, and they said they were going to form a partnership to do watches. And Johan said, you could decide, you know, what the final designs were. Um, so I heard about that. So I went to Jerry Lauren. I said, Jerry, I said, you guys are doing watches. I really want to work on that. And they had already started working with, uh, they didn't have a design team. Mm -hmm. They were working with the design team uh, of IWC, which is one of the watch companies that uh, Richman owned. So, um, and I heard that they, their lead designer was this guy, Giampiero Bodino, who, who uh, those of you who don't know, he was the head of Richman Design, all of Richman. So. He had, a, he had to approve everything from Cartier, Bauman Mercier, uh, Piaget, Vacheron, all the, all the companies, Chloe, a, any aesthetic, mm -hmm. any aesthetics that came out of Richemont, Gian Piero had to approve. He was like Ralph Lauren at, at Richemont. So, uh, so I knew who Gian Piero was, but I knew Gian Piero was a great jewelry designer. I didn't know if he could design watches as well. So um, 
Jerry said, listen, we have a guy. We got Jim Pietro Bedino, worked on Panerai, worked on Cartier. And I'm thinking, oh, wow. <laughs> but I really wanted to do this, you know? So um, I said to Jerry, you don't mind if I talk to Ralph? He says, yeah, go ahead, talk to him. So I went to Ralph and I said, you, you know this is really what I want to do. He says, you know how I love watches. So he said, you know what? Why don't you, we have a meeting in about three weeks. Why don't you design some watches? And uh, bring the, you could come to the meeting, and we'll look, we'll look at what they bring, and we'll see what you could do, you know, what you have. So um, I thought this was a great chance for me because I knew the Ralph Lauren aesthetic, um, and, and I don't think Richemont did. You know, there have been a lot of companies who tried to, to uh, partner with Ralph who they thought they knew what the Ralph Lauren aesthetic was, uh, but it turns out they didn't. So I said, great. So I, I went ahead and I designed a whole bunch of watches, um, on my computer, I'd stay late after, you know, at night and, and, and do stuff uh, on computer. So I designed about, I don't know, 20 watches, something wow. like that, using um, Illustrator and Photoshop. I had no 3D capabilities at, 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 uh, at, at Ralph Lauren at that time. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we come comes to the meeting, I go to the meeting, and there's Giampiero Bodino, I meet him, uh, George Kearns, who was the president of IWC, a few of the designers from IWC, Ralph and Jerry, and um, uh, IWC presents to Ralph these four chronographs that uh, they think w would be great Ralph Lauren watches. And I'm looking at them and I'm thinking like they look so generic, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, they're nice watches, but they could be anybody's watches, you know? Um, knowing the, the, you know, the materials that Ralph liked, I knew Ralph loved carbon fiber and wood and tortoise and, um, uh, you know, it was just a question of how do you incorporate that within a watch design so that it doesn't look cheap or hokey. Right. So, um, so after Ralph talked to them and said, you know, uh, this is a great start. Uh, it doesn't quite look like me yet. Um, it, it was a long discussion. And then at the end of the, of the discussion, Ralph said, this, could, John, could I see what you did? So I take out these folders and I'm showing him. And Ralph was like, oh, I love this with the tortoise around the bezel. It's great. I, you know, so I did a whole bunch of designs that Ralph really loved. So he gave those to Richemont. Wow. It was, it, it, the meeting changed my life because, and what was great was Giampiero came to me and he said, your team did a great job. And I said, Giampiero, I was the team. <laughs> there was no one else who did it. But the next week, uh, they moved me from... Um, being head of men's graphics to the accessories department uh, where I could start doing watch design and jewelry design. So it sounds like Ralph really did trust his internal teams and really had people yeah, he close does. to yeah. him that, that... He, he does, yeah. I mean, you know, it was great that he gave me a chance. Mm -hmm. And then that must have been kind of... Um, I mean, you're, you're sitting with the greats of watch design. And yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know. And to be was, able to be the last person to sort of say, well, take a look at mine. Yeah, that was like, it was surreal. It was really surreal. I had such a big head from that. <laughs> but, but um, you know, I was so excited about it, you know. Um, I was very, I, I was always very passionate about what I did at Ralph's. Um, and the watches was just sort of the icing on the cake for me. So I started working very closely with Jerry, um, uh, Jerry Lauren, myself, um, and the team. In, we eventually built up a team in Geneva that hired a CEO, um, uh, someone who was head of product development, who I became, him and I were like Butch Cassidy, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. We were working very closely together. And um, uh, so I would be designing things. We'd show them to Ralph in New York. If there was something, you know, things that Ralph really loved, I would email them to Geneva. Um, I'd, uh, by that time, I had just started, I had gotten a, um, a 3D system or some 3D software called Strata Studio, which had a, a great modeling engine and had a great rendering engine for not too much money. So I would build things on that, render them, and then uh, do the dials in Illustrator, Photoshop, and uh, send those off to Geneva. They would take my 3D model and they would bring it into, I don't know, Pro Engineer, They'd really have to do a lot of work because, because there wasn't a direct um, uh, interface between my software and what they were using. But they were able to faithfully really make some 3D, they print some 3D models of the cases. So, um, so we started doing that regularly. I mean, every, 
They were coming every three or four weeks. A team from Geneva would come. You know, I'd send them designs. Then they'd come back with the 3D models. Um, did, did you have a sense at that time what the price points were going to be? Or because they are, it's well, I rather knew, broad. Yeah, you know, I knew at the... At the um, it's funny, you know, I, I know Ralph. Mm -hmm. And I know, let's see if we can... Let's see if they're it. there, these this watches is, are beautiful. Yeah, let's see if this is going to work. No, no, no Siri. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, it's Still publishing, wow. I don't know if it's going to work. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it was... It, it, was, it was crazy in that... Um, then I started going to Geneva all the time, mm -hmm. you know, and that was, that was amazing because then, uh, you know, I met everyone, you know, in Geneva is concentrated the entire watch world, right. Geneva and, and there are other parts of Switzerland we went to, but um, I wound up going a lot to, um, a lot of the vendors who would do the modeling for us uh, were in either right over the border in France or uh, for jewelry, we, we went to Florence, we had an office in Florence. How, how did you, because I think this is such an interesting uh, opportunity that you had, because in, you were a watch connoisseur, yeah. and you were a, a, an industrial designer, so you knew your trade there, but you had never designed watches, and, no. and that in itself is a, is a craft that's, you know... Well, of, of, I, I can't really, I'm sort of like the car designer, you know, uh -huh. the car designer who doesn't really know the engine, okay. but he could design the exterior, you know. Uh, he knows something about the engine, how it works, and how everything fits together, but um, I didn't train to, I can't design a watch movement. Mm -hmm. Although being a watch aficionado, I know all the parts of the inside of a movement, you know, and I know the different types of movements, the different, uh, be, but that was because I, I collected watches. So being able to speak the language yes, was yes. important then. And where that really came in, in, in handy is when, you know, Ralph wanted other types of watches. So I'd say, well, let's do a tourbillon. Let's do a minute repeater, or let's do a regulator. And he'd say, well, what are those? So I'd explain to him, really, you know, what types of movements those were. Um, and the difference between an automatic watch and, uh, and uh, a manual watch. And I know that at a certain point, Ralph uh, opened up sort of his world to you in a way that you hadn't before in terms of his car collection. And oh, that was, that was amazing. Yeah, you know, I, well, you know, I love watches. I love cars, too. I love watches, cars, and guitars. Those, <laughs> those are my three, uh, my three vices. Um, They're expensive vices. Yeah, they, they could. <laughs> yeah, they could be very expensive vices. Uh, we should talk about the guitars one. <laughs> I can tell you that. But Ralph, um, while I was working on on the watches, uh, you know, we were always talking about doing an automotive watch. And Ralph said, "I want you to go look at some of the cars and check out." Um, you know, the dashboards, take pictures of the of parts of the body, you know, details. So the first time I went out to, to look at his, his cars, I went out to his house in Montauk, mm -hmm. which was, a, it's not a very big house. It's, it's an incredible piece of property, right on the water, and the, the lawn was beautifully manicured, and the house is not very big. But I said, well, where are the cars? I saw a Jeep in, in the garage near the, the house, then the gardener came around. I said, where do, where do they keep the Ferraris? And he says, oh, that's on the other side of the road. So I go across the road, and there are these three garages. And inside are, you know, there's like 15 red Ferraris, and there's McLarens, and there's Porsches, Mercedes, um, Aston Martins. So... Um, Isn't it one of the biggest oh, I would imagine car collections so. yeah, in the, in yeah. the Well, then he, he wound up buying... Um, he wound up bringing most of the collection to his, um, there's a building he bought uh, near his house in Bedford mm -hmm. that used to belong to Mercedes-Benz where they, they used to keep all their stock for their cars. Ralph bought the building and it's like three or four floors. I think it's three floors. Uh, it's a huge building, but he turned it into, he calls it the garage. I say it's like a museum because when you walk in, you see all the cars and the, you know, the lighting is incredible. It's like museum lighting. Every car is on a, is on a platform um, the only thing I don't like about that is that when I went out to Montauk, I got to sit in everything. I got to sit in all the cars. Um, whereas when you go out to the, to the garage, you, re you can't really touch the cars unless, unless you know, he wants you to. But when we were designing uh, this, this uh, automotive watch, which was you know, the, f 
it wasn't the first, um, and we got a lot of press for the automotive watch. Ralph said, you know, I want you to do this based on the Bugatti, you know. He's got a black 19, I think it's a 1937 or 38 Atlantique, SC57, I think. It's, it, there's only three of them left in the world, and I think Ralph has the most complete one. Uh, he painted it black, but it's an incredible shape. So he said, I want you to sit in that car and look at, you know, observe the car and, and come back and design a watch. So um, I went out to Essex, Massachusetts, where the car was. This guy, Paul Russell, it was before he had the garage in Bedford. And um, I sat in that car, he, and he had a few other Alfa Romeos that I saw, sat, in, uh, sat in, and they were just incredible. Uh, phenomenal uh, craftsmanship. Um, you know, the wood dash was just amazing. So I came back and I designed, you know, I got on the computer and I started designing dials and, and, and cases and uh, came up with the, the automotive watch, um, which we wound up using. Uh, now the price points, what happened was when we first, when Ralph first signed the contract with Richemont, I think initially the price points were supposed to be between 800 and $1,500 for, for a watch. Um, I don't think Ralph read the fine print because Ralph said, I want to do, I want to use manufacturer's movements and I want them to be really amazing watches. So using manufacturer's movements from Richemont, like IWC movements, Piaget movements, Jaeger Le Coultre, those are all real expensive movements. The watches wound up uh, retailing for, I think the cheapest watch when we first launched was um, uh, the Sterup watch, which had a Jaeger Le Coultre movement, and I think it was like 3,400. 3,500, and then they went up. The, the chronographs were 5,000. Um, the Slim Classique that had a Piaget movement, gorgeous watch, uh, was 15,000, 14,000. You know, so, and, and the, the CEO of, of the company was going a little crazy. He said, Ralph, we gotta bring these prices down. You know, so we, we wound up, um, they wanted Ralph to do a quartz watch which Ralph re would refuse to do. Right. It took three years for him to agree to do a quartz watch. And the, how we, we uh, convinced him was that, you know, when you went to the show, uh, when we launched the watches in Geneva, Ralph came to that show. And he went to look at Cartier, and Cartier had these diamond watches that were phenomenal. I mean, pieces of, they were gorgeous pieces of art, and they were watches, but the thing was, all those watches were quartz, had quartz movements. It wasn't about the watch, it was about the diamonds. Right. And the execution and the, and the create, creativity. So Ralph was like, okay, I understand why they use quartz, you know. So that, he sort of got to, we wound up using quartz watches, uh, quartz movements. But then he, um, you know, the, the subsequent watches that we did, we had to do watches that were a little bit lower in price point. Um, so we did a safari watch, which um, we wound up with the safari watch, not using manufacturer's movements. We, we, it was still a Swiss movement, a company called Salita. And we wound up using Salita movements in that, and that was still after we did all the, uh, you know, after the watch was done, it was still $3,000. You know, Ralph Lauren is such a big name, but the watch companies, and you've mentioned a lot of them, like Cartier, are, are oh, yeah. classics, right? Yes. So how, how does a company even like Ralph Lauren sort of compete against so many? We, we really took a lot of hits from the watch world. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, um, you know, I, I go on watch sites all the time, you know, because I'm a watch collector. So when we launched the watches, you know, the stuff that, the, what I call the watch snobs, the stuff they were saying was like, Oh, I'll never buy a, a watch from a fashion designer. But it, what was interesting, there was sort of an under, undertow, if you will. There was a lot of people were saying, you know, if it didn't have Ralph Lauren's name on it, I would buy it. You know, because they were made, you know, the, the watches with the Piaget movement were, um, were assembled in the Piaget factory. They were just as good as Piaget watches, you know, but it didn't have... You know, had That's Ralph so interesting, though, because, I mean, we have a lot of fashion design students, and um, there, there is sort of this idea of luxury connected to, you know, Chanel's oh, and whatnot. Yes, but, yes. But there is a whole category in watches is included where they're not run by a fashion company. Those, those are considered very different yes, yes. level Yes, yes. Yeah, they are. they are. A lot of, well, a lot of fashion companies would, would license out. Mm -hmm. Like, I know Prada one year did a watch with IWC, which, um, you know, being a watch guy, I, I said, I can't wait to see what that's going to look like. 
and it turned out being an IWC watch just with the Prada name on it. Right. Right. And I said, well, why would I buy that? It's an IWC. It didn't have, you know, the aesthetic wasn't Prada. Right. You know? Um, and, and the only other time I got, I got really worried when I heard that Tiffany signed a, an agreement with the Swatch Group. Because the Swatch Group is just like Richemont. They own, you know, 10 other watch companies. They own Bruguet. They own Omega um, and, and several others. Um, and I thought, wow, Tiffany's going to, like, really give us, a, you know, a run for our money. Um, but what Tiffany didn't do is they didn't, within the contract, say that they had final design approval. So now Swatch did watches which they thought Tiffany should do. And I think that's such an important part of Ralph Lauren's legacy, really, isn't it? That he, that he really imbued everything he did yes, with the Ralph Lauren Yes, he did. Aesthetic. And that's, what I, that's one of the things that made me really excited about working with doing the watches was, A, Ralph was going to do really nice watches. He wanted to do watches that were unique, that no one else had out there. Um, and, and that said Ralph Lauren. Um, so that was really exciting to me. Um, several years before they, got, they did get together with Richemont, uh, they were exploring doing watches with Seiko. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I had heard about that, and I saw some of the renderings you know, that Seiko was, was submitting to Ralph. And I said, he's not going to prove those. Because they look like Seiko watches. You know? So, so I, I want to kind of pick up on that a little bit. Sure. Because um, you stopped working at Ralph Lauren about a year and a half ago. There's yeah. been a lot of changes. Yeah. And maybe you can talk about that a little bit. Uh, but at the same time, now you're sort of on your own, consulting and designing for other companies. Yeah. And you've been at Ralph for so long. How do you move from that Ralph Lauren aesthetic that was such a part of your life into... It's actually a, a, a double-edged sword. I mean, um, you know, I was there for 25 years. Mm -hmm. So on one end, uh, on, um, on one hand, it was like, wow, I could just start doing other stuff, you know. And that was a little, that was kind of liberating, you know. Even when I started working for another clock company, you know, Chelsea Clock, you know, they said, show us what you think. Chelsea Clock was like, you did great stuff at Ralph Lauren. Why don't you do some stuff for us that you think would be great for our line? So it was just me designing, you know, what I liked, mm -hmm. you know, and, th and that was really, um, that was great. That was really enjoyable. I really loved doing that. So, so are you doing just watches now? Or are you been able to sort of go back into other areas? I'm, I'm going back into other areas. I'm actually, I've worked on a couple of projects that are not on my... Still public. Public what website. What I think we'll do is... Public website. Yeah, it's still... Oh, there it is, still published. But maybe afterwards, if anyone's interested in seeing some of these watches and things that he's designed, we can show them from the... But um, it's interesting. I do, I've done a couple of projects with um, uh, someone in the city who's doing some furniture design. So I've been going back and doing some furniture design. Um, and the tools I'm using now were much more sophisticated than what I had when I first worked at Home Collection. Um, so it's great because I've been you know, creating these chairs and uh, doing the upholstery on them. And I've been working on lighting, uh, which has been really, it's really been enjoyable, really. I really love doing it. Um, yeah, I, I did some work with, um, I did some work with Bradford Exchange out in Chicago. Mm -hmm. They asked me to design some uh, uh, music boxes, which, <laughs> which was, I didn't know if I wanted to do that, but I did it and you know they, they liked it, so. Um, so what do you think, uh, you know, um, and then I want to open it up to questions. What do you think, um, I mean, you went through a lot of different changes, and, I, and I, I think that right now we're going through major disruption due to technology and yeah. the shift. And you, you, you went through that. You went through the first wave yeah, of I the did. technology. Yeah, I did, I did, And I'm curious now, sort of from your vantage point, you're watching sort of the industry change yet again, yeah. what your thoughts are uh, about that as a designer and how you would approach it, um, say, if you were 20. In terms of technology and the business? Yeah, just how, because design and technology are so interconnected at this point. Yes, yes. Well, you look at companies like H&M, uh -huh. where they, you know, I think it's like six or seven weeks from concept to being in the store, and that's exciting. I think that's really exciting. But the one thing I wonder about, and I, and I don't, I haven't really looked into it, is is there a compromise in quality, mm -hmm. you know? So, uh, so I wonder about that. I, I think, for me, what, what I think is that, is that the fashion industry is, you know, they're sort of preoccupied with a lot of other things right now, you know? And um, 
you know, the internet has, has changed the whole, um, you know, merchandising and, 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 and fashion industry in, in terms of buying, you know. I mean, people don't shop at, you know, brick and mortar stores anymore. Yeah. Um, although I, I keep hearing that's coming back, but if you look at the size of Amazon or, or, or um, Wayfair, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, they ship so much. You know, some of the some of the. So, so what do you think then the role is of the the designer, the craftsperson in all of this? Because as you were joking a little earlier that a secretary could get to design, and yeah. that certainly wasn't true. But we're getting closer well, well, to that I automation. Think, than yeah, ever we we are, we are, and and the computers are getting. You know, with AI, I have no idea how AI is going to affect design. Mm -hmm. You know, but um, you know, I was able to take the technology and use it to my advantage. And, and what came out of it was, what management saw was that I could generate a huge amount of design very quickly, mm -hmm. you know. But what they weren't, um, uh, what they, for them, they were just seeing volume. They weren't looking at the content in terms of what I was designing. Because again, I still think it's gonna come back to the, to the designer, you know. Um, you know, in terms of making the aesthetic judgments of where color goes, where, you know, what's the proportions of things. Right, so there is still that training necessary. Yeah, I definitely, yeah, I, I don't think you could get away from that, you know. Um, you know, once you have that, you could utilize these tools to your advantage. Like I said, you could, um, you know, before I left Ralph Lauren, I was trying to, I was really pushing for them to get into 3D printing. Um, I mean, they're 3D, I mean, you've seen the 3D printed shoes from Adidas and, you know, uh, you know all these companies that are, uh, you know, Under Armour does a, a shoe completely 3D printed, right. you know. I mean, that's really exciting, you know. Um, so, I, you know, I've been, I do keep an eye on technology in terms of what they're doing, not just for, for 3D printing, but, um, you know, if I was starting over again, I'd probably be an, a materials engineer because... Because there's so much going on with new materials coming out, you know. Um, and I particularly, I noticed that very much in the watch industry. You know, one of the things about watches is that magnetism is really bad for them. You know, if you keep your watch near a magnet, you'll notice it starts to lose time or go fast. So, you know, there are all these materials that are being developed that are anti-magnetic, uh, impervious to temp temperature changes. Um, and I try to get some of that into the Ralph Lauren watches, but it was so expensive. Right, these are all the new. You know? Yeah, yeah, it's just so expensive. Um, one company, Panerai, it's a watch company that owned by, is owned by Richemont. They're doing ceramic cases that they're printing oh, wow. uh, and it, with uh, a com combination of plastic and carbon fiber, and it's, it's just amazing, you know. But they're charging a fortune for the watches. So there's a lot of opportunity. Yeah. I want to open it up to the audience. I, um, as, you know, as you can see, he's had a lot of design experience in a lot of different areas. So I think that there could be a lot of, of, of information that he could provide you. So any first questions? And we'll definitely need to use the mic in this room. So thank you. You guys are s scared in this room? <laughs> They always have so many questions. Come on, guys. <laughs> All right. Uh, you want to grab that mic? I can yell. Okay, yell. <laughs> well, because, well, if you look at the history of the quartz watch, the quartz watch, you know, made a big splash in the 70s, I think it was. It sort of really laid waste to the mechanical watch industry. But quartz watches are cheap. And people look at them as, as being cheap. Um, a, a lot of people do. I'm not saying everyone does. Interestingly enough, the, the research shows that women really like to wear quartz watches. They don't like mechanical watches that they have to wind. Is quartz the material? No, the quartz is, um, it's, there's like a battery. And it's, a quartz watch has a, um, well, there are a couple of different types of quartz watches. But... Um, you have a battery that, that uh, has a, that let's say quartz filament vibrate and uh, you know, wind the watch, okay? And because you have the battery there, it'll last for three years or maybe longer. But in terms of the mechanics of it, 
you know, there's, they don't see that as, as beauty. Like, it's like the difference between um, a Volkswagen or a Rolls Royce. They both have engines, but the Rolls Royce is considered amazing craftsmanship, and you know, and it's got a great history. And uh, uh, but they'll both get get you from point A to B. But the quartz watch is going to be always more most accurate. What do you think? I'm curious because that is such a big deal in the in the watch industry, and there is a conversation that's happening in fashion right now between sort of true craftsmanship, handmade versus yeah. uh, mass produced, and if there really is a need in the marketplace for these hand-produced things? That's a very good question. Past that. That's a very good question. Um, I don't know, you know. Um, well, the other thing that to consider is, uh, well, number one, the, the handcraft of watches. Very few people can afford the real expensive ones. Believe it or not, there are watches that are, they say that $10,000 watches sell more than $1,000 watches. There are more people who buy the $10,000 watches than, which I find interesting. But um, uh, the, the watch industry, because of, this, of smart watches, is going through another upheaval. You know, um, you know, the Apple Watch has really changed the whole game. You know, um, I, don't have, I don't have an Apple Watch, but I'm, the third one I may buy. Apple III, yeah, I may buy that one. Um, but then I'm gonna start looking at the graphic user interface on it. And it's interesting, when I went out to Fossil, you know, Fossil uh, took a huge hit when Apple came out with their watch. And so Fossil, what's been selling well for them are their smartwatches. And they do those for Michael Coors, from, for Kate Spade, George Armani. Uh, they do a whole bunch of swat wa uh, you know, smartwatches for people. But, um, if you look at the, the, the graphic user interface on those watches, they all look the same. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the Apple Watch is very different. The Apple Watch is, is very cool, you know, for me. It's very designed. Yeah, it yeah. is. It I, is. I'm also curious because, you, especially in watches, there is a, con, a con, I can't say the word, a connoisseurship. Yes. There is. Um, and that people really do care about the mechanization and how it's beveled and all of the Yes, different yes, formats. the craftsmanship. Yeah, so do you think that that is becoming a niche thing? Because in many ways, um, you know, you, you see a lot of fashion where people might spend $4,000 on a bag. Yes, But they have no idea why it is even that much or what yes. goes into making that bag. And do you right. think... That's from lack of interest, lack of uh, marketing. You know, I, th I think I think marketing and social media have a lot to do with that. You know how, you know, something could be very cool and not necessarily, you know, be made. Uh, you guys familiar with Supreme, right? I mean, it's like they're everywhere, right? Them off white, right? And um, you know, I'm lo I'm looking at this stuff, and it's like. Well, I don't see anything that different from the stuff that we went through, you know. But it does look fresh and it looks cool. So it wasn't, that's not about, you know, the craftsmanship, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and, and I think also it may be an age thing. It's interesting, my daughter who's, um, my daughter works at Ralph Lauren, by the way. They hired her two weeks uh, before they fired me. <laughs> <laughs> they laid me off, they didn't, they didn't fire me. They laid me off. But, um, you know, my daughter went through, uh, growing up, she's, she's 28 now, you know, wanting a coach bag, and then, um, you know, wanting a Fendi bag, and then she got the job at Ralph Lauren, and now she wanted a Chanel bag. And it's interesting, I said to her, do you want, how about a Ralph Lauren bag? She goes, they're okay, but that's not, you know, she didn't want that, that didn't excite her. She wanted the, you know, the mystique, the, the you know, the, the cachet of the Chanel. And I buy her. I did buy her one. <laughs> you're a you're a nice dad. You know, she's into design, and I love I love that. But I can't do it now. But but I did that. But that's an interesting point because the uh, I'm the name's escaping me. The Ralph Lauren bag, the the famous one. The Ricky. The Ricky. Yes. After yeah. His, Twenty five thousand dollars. Yes. So that's that's no cheap bag. No, and it's beautifully made. I'll tell you. You know, I've. I've seen, you know, they, we've had them in, in the, the show, in, the, uh, in our rigs. When we were doing the rigs, we would have, and they did the Ricky bag in, you know, I don't know how many colors of croc that they've done it in. They did it in leather also. Um, and it was beautifully made bag, but um, I don't know if it appeals to the young kids. Right. You know? 
and it also doesn't, I mean, this goes back a little bit to, uh, you know, Ralph Lauren isn't known as a bag company, whereas Chanel. Exactly, right. exactly. And he wasn't known as a watch company, you know, and it's really difficult. But the one thing I, you know, part of it is timing, I think. You know, I mean, you look at Apple, uh, you know, when Steve Jobs said they were going to do the iPhone, you know, people laughed at him and said, you can't do, you're not doing a phone, you know. And, and look, we all have iPhones, right? And it was the same thing with Honda. Honda used to make just motorcycles. You know, when they came out with, you know, their cars, you know, you know people said, oh, that's never going to fly. Another great story about a, a product is, um, you guys don't know about Mini Cooper? The small cars, they're made by BMW. Well, when they first designed that car, they did some marketing research, or the people at BMW did marketing research saying, this is gonna be a huge disaster. They couldn't have been more wrong. It was a cool looking car, and despite the fact that it, you know, it was small, people loved it, you know? I think if you do a product that people will really love, and if the timing is right, you know, like I said, look at Supreme. It looks so fresh, and they're putting it on, you know, it's not that the, the bags are really amazing, but it just looks cool, you know? I mean, if you get a Supreme hat, it's like, I don't know, $40? It's, it's crazy, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> but that's fashion for you. Other questions? I have a really simple question. Who is Jerry? Jerry Lauren is uh, Ralph Lauren's brother. Uh, yeah, Jerry has been with Ralph for... I don't know, he's, the company's 50 years old, probably Jerry's been with them 49 years. <laughs> <laughs> and since you mentioned it, why, I mean, Ralph Lauren has been going through a lot of changes. So uh, you, yeah. were, you were let go a year and a half ago, and I know it wasn't because they wanted to, but. No, well, you know, what was interesting was, I, you know, I kept seeing, they really waited a long time before they let me go, <laughs> I have to say. I saw people dropping all around me. You know, a lot of vice, I was a vice president and a lot of VPs were just going by the wayside. I kept hearing this one was let go or this person was let go. Uh, then they let go of the, the CEO of the watch company in Geneva. And then they let go of five people from the Geneva office. And I said, oh. So I went to this guy I was working with in accessories, John Calcagno, who's a very talented guy. Um, I was he was working with us with the watches as well. And I'd say, John, am I okay? He goes, yeah, of course you're okay. You work with Ralph, it's like, but a lot of people who worked with Ralph were let go. So I was in shock when they, you know, he said, you're fine, you know, and the next day, I, you know, they called me up and it wasn't Ralph, it was uh, uh, someone in men's design uh, who worked with Jerry said, listen, we, they eliminated your job. So um, I sort of freaked out and, uh, you know, I left, I said, I got to leave the building, you know, I called my wife. And I told her, I uh, called my daughter who was on the eighth floor <laughs> right above me. And I said, Kate, I got laid off. And she goes, what? You know, she didn't believe it. But um, then the next day I called Ralph's office because I wanted to get a letter, a letter of recommendation. Um, and his assistant uh, said to me, she said, um, yeah, he'll give you a letter of recommendation. Um, then I got a call the next day and they said, you got to come up, Ralph wants to see you. So I was like, can't just mail it to me. <laughs> you know, so I went up and I saw Ralph and, and he said, listen, uh, we're going through a lot of changes. He says, who knows, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry about this. And, you know, what was sort of tough and, and I don't know, Ralph was, is a very sensitive guy. He, you know, some of us, it was like, if we felt like we were family, even though it was a, it was a public company, you know, um, you know, I've been to Ralph's apartments, I've been to Jerry's apartment, been to his house in Bedford, I've been in all of his cars. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so we had a good relationship, but I, I think part of what had happened was Ralph had hired this guy who is head of uh, H&M, and uh, it was one other company. I think it was at Gap. And he, he was one of the people who worked to streamline the home product development cycle. And part of the product, part of streamlining was to get rid of the companies that weren't doing well. And uh, watches were not doing well because we were competing against Rolex, Cartier, 
Piaget, all, you know, Bruguet, all these companies that have been around for 100 years. So, um, you know, it takes a while. Most watch companies, they say, to become successful take between 10 and 15 years to be successful. And this is the 10th year of Ralph Lauren for watches. And um, it's still not there yet because, you know, watches took a big hit uh, in 2008 and they, they're taking another hit last year, although they said watch sales are up this year, but not for Ralph Lauren. <laughs> you know, and it's, it has nothing to do, the product is, you know, one of the things, I was really proud of the product. I could say, being a watch collector, you know, I know what goes into a watch. I know the movements that are out there. And, you know, I, you know, uh, they were good watches. They're very good watches. Since we're out of time, I just have one last question. Um, oh. <laughs> and unfortunately, they didn't get to see the portfolio. Damn. But if anyone does want to come up and, and, and see the images, I'm sure we could do that. Um, but in, in kind of conclusion, yes. one thing you, you have talked about with me, and you even mentioned it today before we got up here, that portfolio and having images of your work and being able to talk about that, yes. how important is that? That's extremely important. Extremely important to have the portfolio. It's extremely important to have it digital. Not just from a standpoint of going to interviews. You know, when the iPads came out, um, uh, you know, one of the problems that I used to have in design meetings was, you know, I designed a lot of watches for Ralph and I'd bring them to the meeting and Ralph would say, you know, you did a watch a couple of months ago that had this element in it and so I'd have to run back to my office and go through all of my prints and find that. So when I got the iPad, I put everything on the iPad. So I would bring this to the meeting. And Ralph would say, remember you did that watch? I said, wait, Ralph. And I'd go through the, and I'd let him look. You know, and the people from Gene Geneva hated that because you know, they'd have to do a watch that, you know, that Ralph remembered from six months ago. But it was very convenient to have the whole thing there. You know? um, so it's really important to have a portfolio digitally. Um, I mean, even my hand drawings are on, are on the, uh, the iPad. You know, when I went to Tiffany's, when I interviewed with them, uh, it was funny, I had everything on the iPad. They said, we're really interested in your hand drawings. We like your sketches, your jewelry sketches. And um, that was interesting, you know. Uh, I still haven't done work for them yet, though. So. You never know. Yeah, that, no, that's true. Yeah. that's true. No, I've, I've called up Reed Krakow a few times. <laughs> so I actually sent him a package, and he, it was because I sent it to him that they called me up and said, come in, we want to speak with you. So, um, yeah, what else? <laughs> well, I think we, we're out of time, but really? I, um, I'm sure there's going to be a few personal questions, so I okay. want to make sure there's a little bit of that. Um, thank you so much. For no, coming thank you. Today. It was a pleasure. It's such a fascinating story. Thank you. I really, enjoy, I really, you know, I love talking about it. You know, it was, I, I had such a great experience. Um, you know, despite the fact that I was laid off, Ralph Lauren is still. Uh, you know, I think he's going to come out of this, and I, and I think it's going to be okay. I still think it's a good place to work. You know, they're going through changes, but uh, as every fashion company is, you know. So excellent. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.